Good morning, uh, those here in the house, and good morning to those online again. Thank you for being with us. Um, we are um, beginning a new series this week, um, which is exciting. Um, and we are going to be uh, beginning a series called Exiles, The Power of Repentance. Um, we'll build on this subject a lot uh, and go over various um, parts of repentance, but also specifically deeper into the word exiles here. Uh, we are going to be taking our text this morning um, from Nehemiah chapter 7. Nehemiah chapter 7, beginning in verse 1. Alan, you good? You hear me, brother? Awesome. All right, guys. Um, we have a few verses of Scripture um, today, and so today I will not have you stand. I know we like to stand, of course, uh, out of respect for God's Word, but we're going to read our text, um, and then we'll do a little bit of uh, Sunday School for Adults, if you will. We're going to break down some history of Nehemiah and, and, of course, this part of the Bible, and then, of course, go into the Scripture together. So Nehemiah chapter 7, beginning with verse 1, we'll be reading through verse 6. Then it was when the wall was built and I had hung the doors, when the gatekeepers, the singers, and the Levites had been appointed, um, that I gave the charge of Jerusalem to my brother Hananiah, sorry, Hanani, and Hananiah, the leader of the citadel. There's two different people there. For he was a faithful man and feared God more than many. Verse 3, And I said to them, Do not let the gates of Jerusalem be opened until the sun is hot. And while they stand guard, let them shut and bar the doors and appoint guards from among the inhabitants of Jerusalem, one at his watch station and another in front of his own house. Now the city was large and spacious, but the people in it were few, and the houses were not built. Rebuilt. Then my God put it into my heart to gather the nobles, the rulers, and the people that they might be registered by genealogy. And I found a register of the genealogy of those who had come up in the first return and found written in it. That's actually, let me do one more scripture. I think we're that last one, brother. I got, oh, uh, nope, that's perfect. Okay. All right, great. So, um, We'll just say a quick prayer and then we can dive into our, our slides together. We'll go to that next, uh, that first uh, sermon slide, brother. Dear God, I thank you, dear God, I thank you for this morning. I thank you, God, for the history of your people, how we can grow from it, learn from it, God, and move forward knowing, God, that you have great things for us if we learn from our past, the past of others, and once again, learn and move forward uh, as a collective future in God's body together. Anoint me um, as the man of God that I would speak not a word of mine, God, but only your words as your mouthpiece, um, that I would be anointed, God. Touch my mind, my heart, my body, God. Touch my, my people, my brothers and sisters to receive your Father, and that, God, we will grow together. In your name I pray, amen and amen. All right, so we're going to do a little bit of teaching this morning. Um, and uh, I'm getting used to kind of doing some slides here and there, so uh, bear with me if it's uh, something a little bit new. Um, so I want to give you a little bit of history. In looking at the Bible, there are times where we must remember that even though it is a holy book to us, and it is a holy book, is that there's also portions of history for the Israelite people in it. And so to connect that history, we have to kind of think about what's going on in the world and what's going on in biblical times and kind of connect the two dots. Um, so we're going to talk about a couple of things. We're going to talk about the kings a little bit later, but we're also going to talk about a little bit of the timeline here. So Cyrus issued a decree. So one of the kings issued a decree that exiles should return and rebuild, just as Isaiah, as we know, Isaiah was a prophet wrote a very large particular book of prophecy uh, in our Bible. And he prophesied two centuries, so 2,000 years earlier um, in Isaiah 44, 28, um, about this rebuilding. But there were three main leaders that are important to know. Of course, today's scripture comes from the book of Nehemiah. And so Nehemiah is one of our three leaders. As well as we know the book of Ezra, which once again was another one of our leaders here. And then Zerubbabel. Kind of fun word, yeah. So they were the three main leaders in this time. See, Zerubbabel led the people in the reign 
and I'm going to get this to make more sense in a minute. I'm just kind of building a little bit of a foundation here. Uh, Zerubbabel led the people in the reigns of the Persian kings of Cyrus, so during the time of the issued decree, and Darius, which I know that name sounds familiar, and we'll remind you why in a minute. Uh, Ezra and Nehemiah, of course, both who have, once again, uh, things written in our Bible, um, great men of God, were leaders in the reign of Artaxerxes, another king. Okay, so kind of, I know there's a lot of little facts floating around, and we're going to kind of congeal it in a second. Can you go to that next slide, brother? So you see, the return of the exiles to Judah, which is one of the kingdoms, of course, that make up Israel, um, and the rebuilding of Jerusalem, their capital city, was accomplished in three main stages. Okay, the first and main party returned with Zerubbabel in the year 538 BC. They rebuilt the temple. Okay? First step. They rebuilt the temple. Second, a second party returned with Ezra about 80 years later or after that. They make spiritual and religious restoration and reform in Jerusalem. Okay? And the third wave returned with Nehemiah in 445 B.C. They rebuilt the city walls and gates, but not many houses. We're going to call for that, how, that, how, that, how this all ties in together. So that is um, just a layout of the history, okay? Um, all right, so let's give you some context. Can you go back one side, brother? Okay, so um, so in that first slide, I mentioned some names of some kings. I'm going to go through them in order to give you, once again, some context of some biblical books you may have heard, to remind you, some biblical figures or characters or people that you've heard of, and then kind of connecting these dots together. Okay, so the kings of Persia. So in this period, is covered by the books in our Bible of the book of Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. So Cyrus... Um, we have a, 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 a date range that he once again uh, reigned. Once again, he, this, he was for, his reign was foretold by Isaiah. So Cyrus reigned in the latter part of Daniel's life, who we of course know, um, was a mighty man, and of course we know him from Scripture. During Cyrus' rule, Zerubbabel led the exiles, like I said, back to Jerusalem to rebuild the altar and temple foundations. So he led the first group back. Okay. Um, this next king is not actually mentioned in Scripture um, as much, really, if you will, in the Bible. So he's just the next one in the line. Um, you can go to the next slide, brother. Um, the next one for us to look at after that is Darius, which, once again, of course, I know a lot of us are going to have connections there. Um, it's not the earlier Darius the Mede, which is also another historical figure. Um, but in the reign of Darius, the temple itself was rebuilt. And Haggai and Zechariah were prophets, they were alive, and those books were written also during King Darius' rule. Okay? Um, and then you have Xerxes, which is the time of Esther and Mordecai. The whole story of Esther is around King Xerxes. It's the king, of course, that we once again that we know about that happens with the story of Esther and the marriage and all the things that happened once again with the, the children of Israel there. And then Artaxerxes came after, um, which once again was more of a turn and rebuilding led by Ezra and Nehemiah. And all the way takes us to the once again time of also the prophet Malachi. So some of these also just kind of help us connect a lot of the, the end of the Old Testament books, a lot of how those kind of connect with the various prophets and time. Okay? Just some little things I want you to kind of know as you're kind of getting an idea of where we are in Scripture, but also where we are in the timeline of history, if you will. Okay? All right, uh, you can go to the next slide there, brother. And I think we have a, it's going to be scripture again, so you just leave that up there. Or if you want to go back to the, um, actually go back to the title slide if you don't mind. Just have a, a slide to sit there for us. All right, so what we're going to do, I just want to kind of throw a few, through a few thoughts your way. So, um, so when Zerubbabel, once again, he was the first one that led the first group back, led that first party of exiles back to Jerusalem, the first thing they rebuilt was the altar. And what's powerful about the altar is, of course, to us, as well as them, it was a symbol of worship. You see, worship and sacrifice could now begin again because they were rebuilding that altar. You see, they also managed to lay also the foundations for a new temple. 
How many know that without a foundation, the house doesn't stand? Without our foundation, we have nothing to stand on. The Bible says all their ground is sinking sand. We, we literally have nothing firm. I mean, ask any builder. Um, I mean, ask builders like Ben that do any kind of move. If you don't have a firm foundation, the house won't stand, the church won't stand, the building that the mayor lit. Any building has to have a foundation. Don't have one, you, you, you don't start very well. <laughs> you put up walls, they're going to fall down. All oh, the buildings will start leaning. It's just not going to work. You need a firm foundation. And so they knew that if they were to get the altar right and the foundations for build of the temple, they were starting out right. But also it's powerful, let's be honest. If, uh, ladies, you can laugh at the fact that if you, you, if you ask any man that begins a project like pouring the foundations of a temple, the man's going to want to just be hard-headed enough to finish it and just get it done, right? So part of why I think also this was here was that God knew I need to give them the first thing that they need to do so that once they do it, they really want to complete that. And the cool thing is once we get our foundation right, a lot of things also just naturally come into play. See, there were mixed feelings though. Some sang for joy at the beginning. They are excited at these new rebuilds. But there were some older generation that remembered the former temple and all they did was weep. My encouragement to you in this, if we're ever going to move forward as a church, every generation, not just the youngest and the oldest, but every generation in between, we must move forward together. If we don't move forward together, the church will die. That's, you're like, Pastor Luke, that's, that's hard words, but it's true words because the fact of the matter is, older generation, you need the younger but we younger need the older. We have things each other needs, which is why God knew a multi-generational church is how the church is most healthy and how the church most survives. I was literally talking with my mother-in-law about this yesterday. Um, the, the, I did, the, 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 the thought sparked and we were talking. We actually were watching some movie with the kids. And only, only Pastor Luke can pull out random things from movies to connect about a thing about Jesus, but that's just me. Um, and I said, I looked at my, my, my mom-in-law and I said, hey, you know, I want this to outlive me. And like, I know that the Bible, let me, let's be honest, it's, it's been around for hundreds, thousands of years. But I told her, I was like, I want, when, it, when, my, when, I'm a, when I'm an old pastor, I want some young person, some young generation to pass the reins to. And I'll do it with a glad heart, a joyful heart, not a, well, I want to hold on as long as I can to this position. No, I, I look forward to the day that I can pass it on so that the church can thrive and grow. That's, transition is never meant to be a bad thing. Transition's a healthy thing. Let's be honest. Take your favorite fruit or vegetable. If it stayed a plant... Like, or even a seed, let's be honest, you never have the fruit. You never have the vegetable you can eat. Progression, change, stages are needed. But, let's be honest, without the seed, you don't get the plant. Without the older, you don't get the younger. You don't get progression. So nothing is wrong with older or younger. Both are needed because it is a complete picture to know that something needs each stage. It's how maturity happens. Uh, my, my youngest will one day learn her alphabet, and her alphabet will teach her words, and words will teach her sentences, and sentences will teach her paragraphs, which will teach her books. And that's why she'll learn to read. What's powerful in that is, though, but we don't, none of us in this room would go, the alphabet's stupid. No one would say that, because the simple things are needed to build up to the, the, the bigger. Which means, whatever maturity you find yourself in is not bad. It is just the stage you're at. The important thing is not to stay in that stage. No matter what numeric age you are, the maturity you are in Christ, you just need to move forward and keep growing, keep challenging yourself to grow. Because I, I promise you, He'll give you the things you need to grow if you're able to listen and move forward with Him. You see, the story illustrates, though, the fact that trying to make progress in God's work is not always easy. 
However, we should try to do, the, the, once again, with these two things in mind, that it is something of first importance. Make sure what you're doing is important. And also to give it your all. Now, with looking um, a little bit further, excuse me, I want to go walk a little bit through this passage of our text of Nehemiah, Nehemiah 7.1. Can you throw that Nehemiah 7.1 up in there, brother? When we look here at the Scripture, it says, Then it was, when the wall was built... Actually, I'm going to pause a second. You're going to laugh at your pastor. Do you ever wonder why there's a comma there? Often in sentences, we don't pause. We would say, then it was good, then it was bad, then it was, either it was a description, an adjective, or it was something, it was an object. But the scripture says, then it was. This is said this way to point to the fact that it's okay to mark when something has been completed. I don't know about you, but I'm a list guy. I like to check things off my list when I do things or when I get things. It's important that the children of Israel also pointed out that it was okay to mark in Scripture because up to this point, in the first six chapters, Nehemiah has been working and rebuilding. And for those just to remind you about the earlier parts of this book, he's been, at some points, sword in one hand, fighting off people and basically a trial and building a wall with the other hand. He's been working and fighting. And now we get to chapter 7, and then it was. Aren't you glad for times when God completes something? When God does a work? And I'll give you even more good. Uh, aren't you glad when God heals you? Aren't you glad when God strengthens you? When God woke you up this morning? When God provided for you? When it just was? I don't know about you, but there's times where I remind my children... When they get up in the morning and breakfast appears on the table, it's not by magic or just whatever. It, it there because work happened that then mommy and daddy bought it. But what's even bigger than that is that these foods they're eating were grown or baked or put together so that we could buy them in the store. So there's a process that took place before they ever had breakfast. And so there's a thankfulness to go into things that just are. Then it was. And that's a powerful thought to even just hang on with that. When the wall was built and I had hung the doors, how many knows that if you build a wall but didn't put, but, but didn't put doors, that wall's not going to be keeping many things out. Those doors, I don't know about you, could, the great thing about doors is there's a, you can lock a door. You can bar a door. But these walls would have just been stone with a big old opening in it where a door should have been. What's powerful though is when God does a work, He does it in completeness. He doesn't do things halfway. He's not a halfway kind of God. He's a God that knows you need and so He provides each of those things. So on a day when you feel you're lacking, I want to encourage you that you're not. And if you really feel that you are still, Ask the one who provides for you. When my children need something, they just ask me for it. Or if they're really desperate for it, they just tell me, Daddy, I need this. When's the last time that you, look, when you, when's the last time that you prayed to God and said, God, I just need this? You know, and you just were at a point where you just were just stating it. <laughs> all the pretty, prettiness was all of it, and you're like, God, I just need this. And you know what? God's okay with you just saying you need something. But really, if you look around, a lot of the things we have are just there that we need. Um, so when they'd hung the doors, when the gatekeepers, the singers, and the Levites had been appointed. Um, I did some research on these words that I thought was kind of cool. So for those who remember, the tribe of Levi, or the Levites, were where the priests came from for the children of Israel. But I see that the word here was chosen, the word Levite, and not priests. You know what I think is really cool about that? Every member of the Levite tribe was needed, even if they weren't chosen to be the priest. That means 
God has a purpose and plan for you, even if you don't stay in this pulpit. I got real shaken up when I was reading this because I was like, people so often either don't get saved because they feel like Christianity is irrelevant, or they get saved and they feel like they've done their thing and, oh, I'll be a Christian and I'll come to the things and do the things, and that kind of is where my, 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 my need or, what, or, or my role ends. But no, the Levites were needed because they were called as a whole people. Because, let's be honest, they couldn't all be priests. Let me flip the... the you all don't need to be pastors or preachers. Some of you could be. I'm not going to talk about that. I mean, that's between you and God. But the thing is, you all don't need to be this kind of job. You know what's powerful, though, about the jobs of the Levites? Uh, one, a, a big part of the Levites' job as a tribe was the keeping of the house. And part of that, just to boil it down to real ease, meant cleaning God's house. Uh, when I was a kid growing up in, in a small city of Moxville uh, in America, um, there was a lady who used to clean the church. And my dad, uh, being very wise in years, was like, I don't want her to get burned out because she cleans it every week. She was, our, she was the self-proposed cleaning lady of our church. And one day he comes to her and says, hey, take this week off. We'll take care of the church. And um, she very respectfully said, yes, sir. And she missed the next Sunday. And my dad, on Monday, calls her up and goes, I missed you at church on Sunday. And she said, Pastor, I was mourning. I'm sorry I didn't come. And he's like, oh, are you okay? Did someone die? Did everything okay? And she said, no, Pastor. You didn't mean to, but you took my role. And he said, well, I'm, I'm sorry, I was just trying to, make, trying to, so you don't get burned out. And she said, Pastor, you didn't know, but that's where I feel I'm called. She said, I'm called to take care of a house that will bless people. I was called to clean a place because people may think it's just cleaning floors and cleaning bathrooms and toilets and sinks and kitchen. She said, but to me, it feels like a ministry. I'm, I'm getting to clean and make pure as if I'm anointing the house of God. She said, the closest I'll get to doing what you do, Pastor. And she said, that's my role. And she said, I, I respectfully took the week off because you asked me to. She said, but I need to have a moment to mourn. And my dad never took it away from her again, knowing that she wasn't burnt out because her heart posture was that she loved God's house. And she loved whatever she could do. And so cleaning a bathroom or cleaning the floors meant she was loving God. She was glorifying her king when no one else was around. She was, and she was the one, I promise you, and so I'm going to give you a little backstory. This woman wasn't the kind of person that just did a little quick sweep, and once again, if that's what you got to do, because there's a week Pastor Luke has to do, it's all right. But, but, but this lady was the one that was like, how can I clean his house better? She would look at nooks and crannies. She would look high and low. She wanted God's house to be as immaculately perfect as she could do in her human ability. And I encourage you, when's the last time you looked at whatever you think God's calling you to, even if it seems common, to go, how can I best give God glory with this simple thing that I'm doing? And you see, she did it because she knew it's important. And so the Levites were a people that took care of the communion type element and the altar and the fire and the incense. And they, they did all the littlest jobs because the little jobs made the whole be good for the people so that the priests could do their job. Which means I'm going to be real and real transparent like a pastor may or may not have ever been to you. I can't do my job without you. You know, God will empower me, and in my weakness, He will be made strong. But without the church, without its body and its members, we are meant to help each other in a way that completes the body of Christ. Um, I just couldn't get away from that. The small part of the scripture is to really, I want you to know. But the gatekeepers were, as scripture goes on later to tell us, those that stood guard at the gate. But I also want you to know that it's not just face value of they watch the gate. The gatekeepers here had two jobs. You know what their other job was? 
They were worshipers in the church. He said, Pastor, you weird. You smiling about things. I love that worshipers have to be gatekeepers. You know, when I pray for, for the services, I pray for my wife and her worship. Because I know that my wife is, a, is, is able with her worship to usher in his presence so that you can experience God. Before I ever get in a pulpit, I know she's a gatekeeper. And I pray for John because I know John's saying to the door and I know that John, as he welcomes, is a literal gatekeeper to our church. And I pray for my brother Alan knowing that Alan is our gatekeeper online. So knowing that these roles are necessary to usher in God's presence outside and inside these walls is, I can't put into words how needed they are. And so the gatekeepers knew that their job was, I'm going to worship when it's time to worship. But when it's not, I'm going to protect those that need to worship. I'm going to protect those that need God. I'm going to protect those from any attack the enemy might come against me. So there's times where I am your gatekeeper. And I take that role seriously. There's times where at 1030 last night, I was praying for somebody in this church. I don't need to tell you that's not important. The important thing was God wanted me to remind you that I will do my best to stand and protect as a warrior and brother in Christ attack of this enemy against you. But you're also each other's gatekeepers. Because the other part of the role was they would send, they would send protection at the wall and at the houses. And you're like, but Pastor Luke, didn't the, the scriptures say that there wasn't many houses built? Yeah. Did you, get, did you, did you, you caught that connection too, right? That meant that sometimes houses were made when there wasn't physical house to be made. It meant where people were. It meant I'm going to stand guard wherever I feel there's people that need protecting. Because I care about their protection over my own. Uh, but I love that it continues on here and says that I, may, that I gave the charge or the, they were the rulers or leaders of Jerusalem to my brother Hananiah and Hananiah, the leader of the city. Do you know what Hananiah means? It means God's grace. Do you know what Hananiah means? It means God's mercy. Aren't you glad that we have God's grace and mercy? And if we were to put mercy and grace in charge of our city, how much better things would be. But if we once again make sure that we're putting God's grace and mercy, not our man's version of what that looks like. See, the chapter serves as a pivot in the book of Nehemiah, like I said earlier. Chapters 1 through 6 describe the restoration of the wall, and 8 through 13 is actually the restoration of the people of Judah. So it's chapter 7 here that we're in in the middle that begins these verses knowing that we have to be precautious in taking care of what we've worked for. Which means the prayers you prayed all these years for your family, keep praying them. But the prayers you've already prayed, they're going to keep working. But it's also your, your continual prayers that safeguard your old ones. There's no word of it returns void of the word of God. So if you're giving your prayers to him, he'll safeguard them for you. You see, once they had once again built up these, these walls as precaution to guard the newly walled city under attack, um, he basically kept to protection here. Uh, further on it goes into saying uh, in verse 3, um, of course it also ends with saying a faithful man fearing God more than many. I apologize. And I said to them, Do not let the gates of Jerusalem be opened until the sun is hot. Do you know what that basically means? Till it's daytime. <laughs> You're live, though. <laughs> but also, till it's time for gates to be open. In every season, there's a time. There's time for the gates to be closed, there's time for the gates to be open. In love, your pastor reminds you, there's times for you to be quiet and there's times for you to talk. That means sometimes you just need to be reminded that once you pray to prayer in some areas, you've got all kinds of things to pray about. Just leave it alone. It's all right. You prayed and gave it to God. You can go over here now. Which means 
You also can do that in other parts of your life, though. If God has given you a word in your prayer time, if God's given you something to think about for the future, if God's given you promises in His word, His promises are yes and amen. There's, there, you don't need a, these will never move. His goodness, His grace, His mercy isn't going anywhere. You just have to accept them. And once you've accepted them, you have to actually accept them. Now you're like, Pastor Luke, I thought we just said accept them. I did. But let's be honest. How many times have you said yes to something but didn't really think about it before you said yes? <laughs> Hello? Let's be real. There are times where I say yes to my children. I'm like, did I actually think about what they just said? And they go do it. And I go, what did you do? And they go, Daddy, you said I could. Um, so I, I tell you this because there are times where you just say you don't think before you either speak or do. Whew, love you, but I'm just, just reminding you, you do. And so what I say that is because at the end of the day, it's important to know there are times that you just need to, you don't need to say things. Or you need to say things. Like, standing up for justice is always a good thing. Standing up for others is always a good thing. Encouraging someone. I was told years ago that my encouraging nature would get me in trouble one day. And I said, that's a lie of the devil. And they said, why'd you say that for? It's funny because when I, when, when, when I said that, it was to an adult who told my dad later about it. But long story short is my dad was like, no, son, they were trying to keep you safe. But what does God's word say? He always reminded me what God's word said. And you see, God made me the way I am, fearfully and wonderfully, for his purposes. And so long as I'm giving my life to God, God takes care of the rest. Which means my encouragement to someone else, as long as I'm giving it and following God, God will take care of those words once they come out of my mouth. Now, if you just haphazardly open your mouth and say words, like I said a minute ago, God ain't blessing that. <laughs> God doesn't just bless whatever you want to say. But you don't go, I'm going to say this because Luke wants to say this. I'm going to put God's little stamp on it. That's not how it works. <laughs> In love, it doesn't work that way. And so I remind you just to be mindful that, you know, everything has a time. But it's also wise because attacks might come at night. Both literally in, in history, but I don't know about you. You don't have to raise your hands. Unless you want to. That's up to you. Uh, but how many of you, and like I said, you just keep telling me, you're keeping your head. How many times, have, how many of you have ever been attacked, not literally, hopefully, in the middle of the night? And I'll tell you, let me start here. I've been attacked in my sleep. I've been attacked with anxiety. I've been attacked with fear. When is it usually? At night. Know why? Because our minds can get all kinds of places when it's dark outside. Because when it's dark, we can't see the light. Through a season of darkness, even if it's, not, if it's not literally dark, we don't see the light. We focus on the dark around us. So it's easy to let the enemy cloud minds, put things that's not supposed to be there. But you know what's a great thing? We were given a weapon. We were given lots of weapons. We are given this one as a whole. But you know what's the cool thing? We don't need to know a lot of words. You know, you know Pastor Luke Light's words. But you don't got to know a lot of words. You can just know one word. Or you can extend it to three if you want to. But you can just say, Jesus. Mm -hmm. Jesus. And if you think about it for a second, if you just, let's actually all do it together. Everybody in the, the room, on the count of three, I want you just to, you either can whisper it, or you can just say it. But I want you to <laughs> say it and then think how you feel about it afterwards. One, two, three. Jesus. Mm -hmm. You feel different, don't you? Even the most insensitive spiritual person will feel something because there's a, a power in the name of Jesus. Amen. At the mention of that name, there's so much that happens. Whichever way direction you want to take it scripturally, Jesus is just a powerful name. And so knowing that there's a power in simply that word, it can dis dispel, it can send things away that don't need to be near us. What was powerful though about names is later in this scripture and also in chapter 8 we see, uh, both 7 and 8, there's a reading of the first group that came. Now remember, what did history tell us the first group rebuilt? They rebuilt the altar and the foundation. Aren't you glad for those that came before you that built the altar up for you? That set you a foundation? I don't know about you, but my, my work as a parent is to give my children a place to know God and an understanding of God. That's the altar and that's the foundation. Because on that foundation, 
of God's Word and of God and of prayer and of time in His house, everything else can be built. Their lives can be built on that foundation. And so what's powerful is in knowing that was the first thing was, that was done. But the reading of this, when we talk about the genealogy, is they literally read out the list of names who came. Now to us who are you know, 21st century Christians, we're like, another list of names? Skip that, go to the next chapter. <laughs> but you know what was powerful to them? It was powerful because that list reminded them of where they came from and how they got to where they are. To them, it was family. It was uncles, it was aunts, it was cousins, it was priests that they were, the, oh, my grandmother served underneath that priest, or my great grandfather. And it was history. One day it'll be an encouragement when, when, when this church sort of outlives us, because let me just be honest, let me just say it now, not even for us, but you can be encouraged by it. But so the devil hears, this church is going to outlast all of us here because God's work is not going to be done in Scotland. We're going to do our part, but it's going to keep going as time goes on. But what's, what's really cool though is through the ledgers of time, They'll look back and go, oh, Alan and Carol, they were at, at, at Nairn Church of God. And, oh, and they'll, they'll, they'll mention names. And it'll be an encouragement knowing who set up things for them to have the church body that they have now. That generations will be affected by what you did, right. by your attendance. Yes, your attendance. Being here matters. Your prayers mattered. You know, you guys think that, oh, you come Thursday on midweek we pray for the needs of our people. And you're like, oh, that's just the needs of others. Yeah, but what's powerful is your prayers week to week will affect generations to come. But what I, I say, I'm gonna, and I say that, and then we'll say a, a follow-up because God wants me to lovingly smack you. Um, you got to believe it, though. Pastor Luke can encourage you all day long, and you've known me the time you've known me, and I've always been that way, and I will always be the, the quirky, encouraging American dude. Um, but I say that is that you need to know that I will keep telling you because I want you to really believe what I'm telling you. I say I love you because I mean it, and I want you to know it. But I tell you the gospel because I really want you to know it. But I tell you how wonderful and smart and talented and anointed and blessed you are, not because I want to puff you up, but because I want you to know that God made you in a way to know that He intentionally thought, hmm, I'm going to make such and such this way. I pretend, I pretend God has a, a clipboard a lot. You said that over me. Um, I, you know, I got a little human humor there. But the fact is, God intentionally thought about you thousands of years ago. At the beginning of time, He went, hmm, in that year, this person's going to exist, and I'm going to make them this way for such a time as this, for necessary needs of what need to happen. And so it's powerful knowing that you can rest in that. Um, we'll continue on real quick. And so the gates were once again that so that, that, that there was a safety there, and they would stay in guard. Um, and then appoint guards from among the inhabitants, you know, the next scripture, the brother, uh, from the inhabitants of Jerusalem, one in his watch station and one in front of his own house. Now the city was large and spacious, but the people in it were few, and the houses were not rebuilt. Um, I want to also encourage you that choosing to rebuild the walls over their own houses is important because, let's be honest, you move to a new city, what do you think about first? Where are you going to live? Not about you. I moved across the ocean at first. I was like, where are we going to live? Where my, where my crazy crew going to live? we got to figure this out. But they didn't here. They rebuilt the altar and the foundation and started rebuilding the temple. They built the walls. And the houses came later. They didn't forever live not in, a, in a house. They eventually had houses. But what's powerful is they put their priorities in the right order. They knew that God needed to come first and the beliefs and foundations need to be refixed. They need to be protected because they're protecting each other. Unity was important. Because when there is a foundation of God, His love and all His, all His good things, when you protect each other, you're in unity. Everything else takes care of itself. And there's a powerful picture knowing that Nehemiah was, once again, moved with the compassion to do certain things, including the fact that later, once again, God put it into my heart to gather the nobles, the rulers, and, um, the next side there, brother, and the, I think it's the people, 
Yeah, and the people. Do you know what that basically meant? That meant those three groups he mentioned meant he gathered everybody. But the reason why it doesn't say he gathered everybody, he, it said each list, knowing that each of those groups, when gathered together, were a people. They weren't peoples. They were, but they were a people. Because when my people are called by my name, another scripture, of course, tells us, humble themselves and pray. You know, there's the healing of land that happens. God's over and over again healing the people, healing them mentally, emotionally, physically, healing their cities, healing them as a people, unified people. Um, and of course, once again, he registers and speaks to the, the genealogy as an encouragement to them. Um, if you'll go on, stand with me. We're going to be wrapping up service. Um, like I said, the story of Nehemiah like I said, begins with a message. You move. Excuse me a second. She moving and making me make, make, make me worry. Ashley, girl, come here a second. You want to yell at Dad for a second? You're all right. Come here. You're all right. Miss Hilda needs some cuddles. So the story of Nehemiah said, begins with a message from his brother about the state once again of disrepair in Jerusalem. And Nehemiah is moved to go build those walls. That's what happens at the beginning. And so even though the effects of the exile had worn down the city and worn down the people, there was still a resiliency and a need to know they needed to follow God. So through broken hearts and moved emotions, once again, they're taken back. To establish community with each other. Um, you see in the setting, um, this census, like I said, this, this census list, it provides data that once again really is encouraging them, them that this is where they're going to live. Through each generation, through each time, and that God will sustain them. He will keep them through every generational change, through every transition um, and that once again in this worship um, is part of that where that starts it, it starts with worship it starts with that foundation it builds to the protection and unity of the city and its people knowing that God is simply good God is love and God wants us to be one uh, if you can bow your heads and close your eyes with me for a minute, for a minute. I'm going to uh, give an altar call or to pray for each other. But if you like I said, just during this time, if you can just, you know, like I said, no one looking around, just eyes closed and heads bowed. Uh, I'm going to say a prayer for you and over you. But I want you to pray for yourself that God would help you to understand as time goes.